שלום, 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 שלום. As always, first I want to give all the praises and the glory to Yehawa, Bahasham, Yehawa Shai, Bahasham, Raka Kodash, Yehawa is the Most High's name, Yehawa Shai is the Son's name. Double honors to the apostles, to the elders of Great Millstone, our teachers, for the powers of the Holy Spirit, Shalom, and Shalom to the hopeful elect brothers and sisters who have been edified by the truth of the scriptures of who we are, the true children of Israel, and who the other nations are. Shalom, shalom, shalom. So, today's edification from ancient Egypt to Rome to America. From ancient Egypt to Rome to America. So, we know, or well you should know, this is what we are looking at here, is the reverse side of the Great Seal. Right, the American dollar, where you see the pyramid and the bald eagle. Pyramid to the left and the bald eagle to the right. So we're just going to go into a little bit of this today, just to show you that how we understand, how we know America is spiritual Egypt and also symbolically it's the reincarnation of the Roman Empire America is the reincarnation of Rome itself you have you know if we was to look at the Roman Empire today it would be the amalgamation of all of these European nations and where would its capital be it would be America America would be Rome within that Roman Empire because all of these European nations are part of the Roman Empire and this system, this global system that we are ruled under is the reincarnation of the Roman Empire. America is also symbolically, spiritually known as Egypt, all right, as you can see. And there's many other things that we can draw to to make you understand that America is symbolically known as Egypt, all right? So, we know that they have the obelisk, the obelisk in America. It's, they call it the Washington Monument, which sits in the heart of the capital of America, which is Washington, D.C. But and we also know that the bald eagle is a symbolic sign. So we're just going to read a couple of things here. We're going to go through this. I'm going to read a couple of things that I've got pulled up here on the screen. All right. So we've got that, and we've got the we've got the bald eagle. which is the American emblem, as you may or may not know, which is why you see it on the back of the US dollar. So, this is, let's go here first. So, this is the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. This is an official website of the United States government that we are looking at here, all right? This is the... Uh, it's called the engraving, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. So we're just going to read something from here. And then we're going to go to, just so that you can understand how we know. I mean, America knows themselves. It says here, it says, what is the significance of the great seal of the United States on paper currency? So why are we looking at this great seal on a paper currency? All right. Because in the book of Deuteronomy 28, it speaks about, this nation, one of the curses, when it says the Lord shall bring a nation against thee, against Israel, from far, from the ends of the earth, 
as swift as the eagle flies. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. And we continue to contest that that nation is talking about the United States of America. It's the Europeans, but it's America where everything went. That's the eagle. That's the, that's the swift as an eagle. America's emblem, North America's emblem is the eagle, all right? The bald eagles. Its role is a national symbol. Right, and it's linked to the Great Seal, which, which, which we're going to read. So, this is one of the main curses that the Bible speaks of. Right? The, Lord, the Lord said it's going to happen to the children of Israel. All right? Now, we hear from time to time that they say, oh, these curses don't apply to us, these curses don't apply to us. Well, we know one trillion percent these curses do apply to us. They apply to the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. They apply to the descendants of the Native American Indian tribes of North South American Canada, today who they call Latinos, Hispanics, Mexicans, and Puerto Ricans. Those are the 12 tribes of Israel, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. So we know that these curses apply to us. All right? So, and we also know that this place that this nation that Deuteronomy 48, 28, 49 is speaking about is this nation is a nation of Edomites which created this place called the United States of America which made the bald eagle the national emblem and it's all part, it, part of its creation is all to do with Egyptology and the Roman Empire all right bits of both society. So, where was we? We was here. So it says there, what is, this, what is the significance? What is the significance of the Great Seal of the United States on the paper currency? So it says, the face of verse of the Great Seal first appeared on the back reverse on the $20 gold certificate series of 1905 and in 1935 both the face and the back of the seal appeared for the first time on paper money on the $1 silver certificates so let's read down here it says here obverse side of the great seal the most prominent feature in the American board eagle is the American board eagle supporting the shield or, or the escutcheon, which is composed of 13 red and white stripes representing the original states, which were the 13 states of the north, right? And a blue top, which unites the shield and represents Congress. The motto, E, pluribus unum, means out of many, one. So that's referring to, oops, go back there. Where are we? That's referring to this, E pluribus unum, out of many, one. All right, that's on the great seal, on the back of the dollar, where the eagle is. This is the eagle. That's the olive branch. Those are the arrows. The American flag, the 13 stars, which represented the 13 states, the original states of the United States of America. Let's go back. It says the olive branch and the 13 arrows denote the power of peace and war. We always say to that's what they do, right? First they, they'll come with their, um, they'll send their representatives to you, America, and if you don't do what the representatives of the United States require of you, then they go to economic sanctions before they send their military, right? So that's why they have peace and war. The olive branch represents peace, the 13 arrows represents war, which is exclusively vested in Congress. The constellation of stars donates a, a new state, it's taking its place and rank among the other sovereign powers. Now, the reverse side of the great seal, the pyramid, signifies strength and duration. The I over it and the motto, Anuit Coeptis, means he, 
God has favoured our undertakings, all right? That's it there. He, God has favoured. So that's what they're referring to when they say on here, where it says, a new coeptus. He, God, favours us, favours America. All right? This all goes back to, but you're going to see anyway. So, it says... It says the I over it and the motto a new coeptus, he God has favored our undertakers, allude to many interventions of providence in favor of Americans' cause. The date underneath is that of the declaration of the independence and the words under it, Novus Ordo Seclarum, a new order of the ages, signifying the beginning of a new America in 1776. So now we're going to go to the, this is Getty, all right? This is one of the richest people in the world. These are the families that you, that you very rarely hear about, the Getty family. These guys are soaked in money. This is one of the top, this is one of the families that, this is one of the top families that sits on the, the, the Illuminati, sits on that table of 13 at the very top, the Gettys, all right? They're like the Oppenheim families, all right? It says here, it says, Eagle as ideal ruler from the ancient world to the what to the founding fathers the founding fathers of where of america this bird of prey traveled a long way from ancient egypt to rome to the medieval beastery before landing in the u.s all right so the medieval beastery that's just beastery are books about books on animals right that describes that that would describe real animals and mythical animals right that's what beastry is. That's a, that's like a book that just has a picture of an animal, and then they would have a description of it. It will have animals that we know about and mystical animals that we've never seen would be in that same book. That's what that is. So this is the eagle, right? This is Getty's library, right? As you can see. So let's read down here. It says, most Americans are familiar with the symbol of the eagle. We see it on the backs of the dollar bills and quarters, mounted on the podium during the presidential speeches, and even representing sports teams. Where did the pervasive imagery come from? The founding fathers chose the bird to represent our country in 1782. But eagle imagery can be tracked back much further back in the time, back in time than that. Much, much can be traced back much further back in time than that, right? So, from Egypt to Rome, it says traits we commonly associate with the eagle, such as the strength, shrewdness, and leadership emerged in ancient Egypt over 4,000 years ago. It says the Romans appropriated eagle imagery when they conquered Egypt in 300 BC. Now, I think that should say 30 BC because Rome, the Romans didn't conquer Egypt in um, 300 BC. Um, Alexander the Great did. So Edomites conquered Egypt in 300 BC. The Romans are Edomites, but it wasn't the Romans, I can definitely tell you that, that conquered Egypt in 300 BC. That would have been the time of Alexander the Great. And when he died, it became known as the Ptolemy, part of the Ptolemy Empire, Egypt. All right. And then the Ptolemies became the new pharaohs. That's when you had the first Caucasian pharaohs, Edomite pharaohs of Egypt under the Ptolemies. So I think that should say 30 BC, because that would have been during the time of, in 30 BC, I believe, would have been during the time of, what's his name? What's that emperor's name? Is it Octavia? Julius Caesar's son. Even maybe before that, it would have been around probably 49 BC when Caesar crossed the Rubicon and invaded Rome and then a few years later probably around 47 46 BC that's when Julius Caesar invaded Egypt and he made Cleopatra his queen remember Cleopatra ethnic ethnicity is a Macedonian Greek Meaning she's an Edomite, all right, Cleopatra. So Caesar, Julius Caesar, invaded Egypt around 47 BC and kind of made it um, a vassal of Rome, 
of the Roman Empire, but they didn't take it down in 300 BC. That would have been done by um, Alexandra, Edomites, but Alexandra the Great, just so you understand. All right. So it says there, they may have mistaken the portrayals of Egypt's patron deity, Horus, who took the form of a falcon, right, which makes sense, for an eagle, because a falcon does look like an eagle, all right? If we was to quickly get Horus, the image of Horus up himself, Horus, that's a falcon, well, he looks like a, yeah, see, the, the falcon does look like an eagle. So this is where they believe it, it kind of goes back to, that the Romans, which makes sense, took that imagery from Horus. There you go, look, this is a falcon-headed Horus, who looks like, an, looks like an eagle. All right? Because Horus, Horus was considered a god. He had a falcon head, but it looked, he wore a falcon head. That's the images of him, basically. He looked like an eagle. So that would make sense to me. That would definitely make sense to me. That that's where the Romans mistake, they mistake the falcon for an eagle, all right? Which would make total sense to me that they did <laughs> mistake the falcon for an eagle, the Romans. So let's go back to this. Oops, sorry. No, where was I here? So it says here, it says the Romans incorporated the symbolic, it says, this may have mistaken, this may have mistake, they, sorry, may have mistaken portrayals of Egypt's patron dietary Horus, who took the form of a falcon for an eagle. At his, at his birth, Horus was brought to have flown, to have thought to have flown to the heavens and brought back light to the kingdom full of darkness. So Horus is the son of Isis and Osiris, right? Egyptian pharaohs. A feat that made him the symbol of an ideal ruler. The Romans incorporated this symbolic meaning into their own culture in 107 BC. Roman general Gaius Marius designated the eagle as the emblem of the Roman army. The eagle is the emblem of the American army of, the, of America, right? Same thing as the Romans. Presenting Rome as the ideal ruler in the global sphere. It says Roman author Pliny elaborated upon the characteristics of the eagle in natural history, commenting on its keen eyesight and parenting behaviors. Well, sounds like America, right? They always want to be the they, they want to be everybody's parent. Everyone's their child, and they're the parent, right? That's that's America. It says the eagle, he said, would force its newborn children to look into the sun, throwing any child that looked away out of the nest. So this is a um, from the, what do they call it, what they carry? So the Romans carried this thing called, uh, I forget what it was called again, man. Um, hold on. That's Horus. Let's, let's say the Roman eagle. I forget what it's called again. It's, it's gone right in my mind. The Roman eagle. That's it. The Aquila. <laughs> One of the Israelite women's name is that in the New Testament. Aquila. Okay. Aquila. That's what they called it. That's what the Romans called it. Right. They called it the Aquila. That's what they carried when they went to war. All right. They call it the Aquila. The Romans. The Roman soldier will carry the Aquila into battle, basically. The picture of it here. So, that's what they would carry into war, the Aquila. So let's go back. So this is a real Aquila that like we're looking at here. All right, this is a real Aquila that dates back to around 100 AD. This is a Roman bronze, 41 inch high Aquila. This is in the John Paul Getty Museum, all right? So this is the American emblem. So when we read Deuteronomy 28 and 49, we know this is talking about 
This is talking about the Romans, right? The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from one end of the earth, and swift as an eagle flies, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Now, the reincarnation of the Roman Empire is America. As you can see, it says, a nation of fierce continents which shall not regard the persons of old, nor show favor to the young. All right? America is the reincarnation of the Roman Empire. These European nations are the reincarnation of the Roman Empire. And if we was to say, where is Rome? Where is the capital of this Roman Empire? It would be, it would be where their military is, right? Where the military might is. Because ancient Rome always relied on its military to get what it wanted. Just like how modern Rome does, America. So if we wanted to say where Rome itself was within this empire, we'd say that would be America. That would be the reincarnation of Rome itself, would be America. Spiritual Egypt, right? Spiritual Sodom, symbolic for Rome and Babylon, right? That's America. So the same eagle, the Aquila, that the ancient Romans carry is the same what the modern Romans carry. America, the American army. It says here, so jump down to here a bit. Is king of birds I want? Okay, here it is. Predatory bird turned patriarch. When the founding fathers gathered at the Continental Congress of 1782, it is no wonder that they landed on the eagle as the emblem of America. This is the height of slavery, all right? It invoked both the supreme military and political power of the Roman Empire. That's why they chose it. These are your Romans today. They understood every part of why they chose it because it invoked both the supreme military and political power of the Roman Empire, which is what America is today, a supreme military and political power, and the divine power of Christ. They claim to be a Christian nation as well. It says, the eagle clutches an olive branch in its left talon, just like the branch the dove clutched in its beak as it returned to Noah's ark. That's the dove that Noah sent out to see if the waters had abated. And it came back with a, a leaf from an olive tree. And then a few weeks later, he sent it out again. And it never came back at all. And that's made, made Noah realize that the waters are definitely abating. So that's what they're talking about. The dove that clutched its beak as it's returned to Noah's ark. Signifying perpetual peace. In the right talon lies a bundle of arrows. Signifying military might associated with the Roman army. So the next time you take out your wallet, blast Hotel California by the Eagles or catch up on the NFL football, think about just how far that symbolism, as we keep telling you, that's what it's all about, has travelled before landing on your pocket, headphones or television set. This is why America has it. Now, where is it? That's the emblem, that's the horrors. This is why it's on the back of the dollar bill. Then they got the pyramid. This pyramid signifies Egyptology, the C and I. So where does that all go back to? That goes back to Egypt. Nervous, ordo, secular, new order of the world. All right? Because that's what America was going to bring, a new world order, which is what we are, we are seeing, in a sense, the last egg end of this new world order, the last part of it to be implemented, which we tell you time and time again, this is where we're going to go to the, the microchip is like the last leg part of them fully implementing this new world order. But this thing has been in plans for centuries, right? That there was going to be this one world order. So why would they have the CNI and the pyramid? So the eye we know goes back to, to the eye of Horus. The eye of Horus is an ancient Egypt symbol representing protection, health, and restoration. So when we say, when we go to Deuteronomy 28 and 68, and we say America is spiritual Egypt, 
when it says, and the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again. Now the word Egypt is synonymous with bondage, slavery. So if we was to go to, say, uh, it's Exodus 20. Let me just hold on, land of bondage. We go to the word land of, oops, if I can spell right. Land of bondage. You'll see that's synonymous with Egypt. I, the Lord, have thy power, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of what? The house of bondage. That's what I meant to say. So lucky, house of bondage. So the word Egypt is synonymous with house of bondage. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Brought you forth out of the land of Egypt and the house of bondage. Land of Egypt, house of bondage. It's synonymous with that, right? All the way through the Bible. All right? Hence where we say that. What is America synonymous with? Slavery. Because it was a house of bondage as well. So, when we see on the back of the dollar, it has the pyramid. It shows us that this is, America is spiritual Egypt. So when the Bible says, Deuteronomy 28, and the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again, into bondage again, with ships, slave ships. By the way thereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. All right? We're not going to see we came out of the, the wilderness. We came out of ancient Egypt into the wilderness. We're not going to see the wilderness again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies. Our main enemies was Esau, Edom. Our second enemy was Ishmael, the Ishmaelites, the Arabs. So these are our enemies. To know who your enemies are, Israel, we go to... We go to Psalms 83. Come on, stop doing that. We go to Psalms 83. So this list is, is Israel's enemies. So when we say, for lo, thy enemies make atonement, and they that hate thee, that put us into bondage, have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, against the true children of Israel, and consulted against thine hidden ones. That's why the Lord said in Hosea 1 and, 1 and 11 or 1 and 9, in that place where it shall be said unto you, you are not the children of Israel. This is why we're referred to as the hidden ones, right? Hold on. In Hosea. Everything adds up. Everything adds up. You see, we got the receipts. We just got to follow the money because we got the receipts. So when it says here, Yet the number of children of Israel shall be as a stand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in that place, which is America, Babylon the Great, spiritual Egypt, modern day Rome, where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, because we are the hidden ones. There it shall be said unto you, Israel, unto them, the true children of Israel, you are the sons of the living power. You are the sons of Yasharallah. You are the sons and daughters of Israel. That place is spiritual Egypt. Symbolic Rome, symbolic Babylon, symbolic Edom, spiritual Egypt and Sodom. That's America. Go back to, that's why it says, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thine hidden ones. Because we were called all these other names, right? They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. This is why I say, this is why they call themselves Israelis. <laughs> Because the name of Israel is no more in remembrance. They call themselves Israelis, those small hats in the land of Israel today. For they have consulted together with one consent, the nations. They have confederate against thee via the, via the United Nations, the tabernacles of Edom, the so-called white man, and the Ishmaelites, the Arab is the second one. Both of those nations played major parts in the transatlantic slave trade. You had the Arab slave trade and you had the transatlantic slave trade. So both of those nations took us into slavery. But the one that took us into slavery by cargo slave ships is Edom, the Edomites. So if we go back to 
Deuteronomy 28, when it says, and the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again, the land of bondage, into slavery again, by ships. The Edomites did that. The Arabs played a major part in our enslavement, but it was the actual Edomites that put us on those ships and brought us to spiritual Egypt, symbolic Rome, symbolic um, Babylon, which is America. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again, and there you shall be sold unto your enemies, the Edomites, for bondmen, slave men, and bondwomen, and no man, no person, shall buy you. That word buy in the Hebrew is konar. Remember, that word doesn't mean no one's going to come and buy you when you're on the slave block, on the auction blocks, because we were bought and sold for 400 years. So we, so we know it doesn't mean that. That word is konar in the Hebrew, right? Which means to redeem. No man's going to redeem Strong's you. Strong's H, 7069. Kana. Kana. Which means to redeem, right? No person is going to redeem Israel. Of the Most High originating, creating, redeeming of his people. No Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharp shooting Sharpton. Um, Barack Obama, Malcolm X, you know, my, you know, all of these people. In England, we had Bernie Grant, you know, whether it's Bob Marley singing on the stage saying, well, we're going to redeem. No, no one's going to redeem us. But Yahweh Shai, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ. So that word means no man is going to redeem you. No human is going to redeem us. We're going to be done by a celestial being and the angels. All right. So we know categorically that this Egypt is talking about the land of bondage, which is America, right? We go back to the Great Seal. Where are you? Where are you hiding? This is why they have this, the C and I and the pyramids. So when we see the C and I, it goes back to the eye of Horus. According to the Egyptian myth, Horus lost his eye in a struggle with Seth. Seth was Horus's uncle. Seth was the brother of Osiris. Osiris was Horus's father, right? And Isis was his mother. The eye was magically restored by Hathor, and this restoration came to symbolize the process of making whole and healing. For this reason, the symbol was often used in amulets. This is where it comes from. When you see the C and I, it's the eye of Horus. Horus was also known as Ra, the sun god. That's why you see the bright sun shining behind it. This is all Egyptology. Remember, also, in... Uh, where is it? So we went to the eagle. If we go to the... Oh, Obelisk, is it obelisk, obelisk, obelisk in Washington. This is more the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument is a hollow Egyptian style stone obelisk. That's what it is. This is in the heart of DC. You see this? They call it the Washington Monument. Is an oblique shaped building on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., built to commemorate George Washington, a what? A founding father of the United States. All right? Everything's about the, the founding fathers, how they established that place, but it all goes back to Egypt or Rome. All right? Literally. Symbolically known as Babylon the Great in the Bible, that great place, the daughter of Babylon. All right? So in America, as you can see, it says construction of the presidential memorial began in 1848. The construction was suspended from 1854 to 1877 due to funding challenges, a struggle for control of Washington's National Monument Society and the American Civil War. All right. It says here, it says the Washington Monument is a hollow Egyptian style stone oblix with a 500 foot tall column surmounted by 
55 foot tall pyramidion, right? Look at that. A, pyr a pyramidion is an uppermost piece or capstone of an Egyptian pyramid or obliques. Speakers of the ancient Egyptian language referred to a pyramidia as a ben a benbinet and associated the pyramid as a whole with the sacred benben stone. All right. During Egypt's old kingdom. So the Washington Monument is a hollow Egyptian style stone obliques with a 500 foot tall column surmounted by a 55 foot tall pyramidion. All Egyptology. So if we go to is it Revelations 11. Revelations 11, verse 8. So when it says here, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually, as we say it's known, called Sodom, for its transformer population and its love for the alphabet community, right? And it pushing it upon the globe. That's the, that's the chief place of, of sodomy is America. To push, that's put it on the whole world. It's spiritually known as Sodom and Egypt. Egypt for slavery, because the word Egypt means the land of bondage. America was a land of bondage. And also for its ties symbolically with Egypt. To so the sea and high, Horus, the sun god Ra, the god, the pyramids, to the Washington, Oblitsk. Let's have a look at some, some of those pictures. Hold on. Let's have a look. Images. You see? Look at this. This is what's sitting in the middle. This is it here. The Washington Monument. That's America. That's spiritual Egypt and Sodom. Also symbolic, known as Babylon the Great, Edom, because Edom is the name that was given to Esau, the Edomites, or today who we know as the so-called Caucasian, so-called white people. That's America. Everything, all roads lead to the United States of America. So when people try to Come and say, oh, how do we know Egypt's talking about America? It's, it's, it's there. It's out there for you to see. And I'm just showing you once again. How do we know it's Rome? Remember, what does America have? They have a, we have the Rome Senate versus, let's see what it says, the American Senate. They both have Senates. Remember, they both have these, right? The Roman Senate was the representatives of Roman people and the repository of Roman sovereignty. How is the Roman Senate similar to the US Senate? Both bodies are created to gather the most influential persons in public life, whether stemming from political, financial, military, diplomatic, and other key areas. However, the democratic nature of the US Senate greatly differs from the Roman predecessor where life appointments were usual. All right, so they had more, well, life appointments were here. You, you know, you serve your terms as long as they keep voting you in. We have the Roman Senate. <laughs> the Roman Senate. Look at this. This is the Roman Senate. That's the Roman Senate. We have that in America. We have the American Senate. They call them senators, right? It's the same thing. They go into the Senate House. They discuss. They, they make laws. And then they send it to the president. To their president that in their times would have been the emperor, right? Let's have a look at here. Okay. Rome Senate versus US. Rome 300 members. America 100. Chosen from the uh, aristocracy for life. Elected for the pe by the people for six year terms, right? And, and most of them do that job for life anyway, all right? Controls foreign and financial policies. Makes laws. Advises the president on foreign policy. Advises the council. This is where the American Senate gets it from, from Rome. 
This is the eagle. This is why they have <laughs> the eagle on the back of their dollar. Because that eagle goes back to the Roman eagle, the Aquila, which they carried into war with them. America is the head of the Roman Empire. That would be Rome within the Roman Empire. All of these European nations are part of the Roman Empire. Just like how Rome had, how many, let me just see, how many uh, garrisons did Rome have? Let's see if it comes out. Total garrisons, 15,044. That's how many garrisons Rome has. Yeah. What's the garrison of Roman soldiers? Temperatory courts of 1,000 men each and 1,000 equity singulars for a total of 24,000 men. The garrison of Rome underwent an important expansion which may already have occurred during the third century. There are 10 Praetorian cohorts of 1,000 men each and 1,000 equisites signaries for a total of 24,000 men. Roman garrison. The Romans' castro or military garrison towns were protected by rampants and ditches and interconnected by straight military roads along which their legions could speedily march. Like the Chinese, the Romans also built walls to protect their empire. The most famous of them was Hadrian's Wall, which is in the United Kingdom. So their garrisons are like what America, America, our American bases. If you say American, how many American bases? Let me just see. How many American bases? Because a garrison would have been an American base. Its largest in terms of personnel is Rummerston Air Base in Germany with 9,200. The Pentagon stated in 2013 that there are around 5,000 bases total. 5,000. And that was in 2013. Around 5,000 American bases. The Romans had how many? 15,044 bases. Garrisons. A garrison is a base. These are the same people that are in charge. America is modern day Rome. It is the place where the eagle, its representation is of the eagle. So I just really want to kind of just bring a little bit of that out today. That's Rome. This is why they have these symbols on the back of their money. They are spiritual Egypt and symbolically represent Rome. That's the United States of America. That's Babylon the Great. That's also known as Edom, the daughter of Babylon. Doesn't matter what these people wanna keep on trying to tell us, that America is not modern day Rome. It's not symbolic, it's not, does, it's not spiritual Egypt. Everything shows us that it is. And through every action proves that that's who it is. It's the reincarnation of the Roman Empire. It's spiritually known as Egypt. So on that note, I pray you are edified by today's edification from, from ancient Egypt to Rome to America. Yeah? I just kind of wanted to just shed some light on that today for the hopeful elect of the House of Israel to know that how we know these things we not just talk these things, we know these things, we know them ourselves. So, I want to give all the praises and the glory to Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Rakar Kadash, double honors to the apostles and the elders of Great Millstone, and Shalom to the hopeful elect house of Israel. All praises and glory to Yahweh, Bahashim, Yahweh Shai. Shalom.